Well, I've missed you. Have you missed me? Let's find out. It's time for another show from Colin Jones, the reasonable adventurer. Time for you to take another step towards creating your own opportunities for satisfaction. And it is a huge welcome to you all to episode 91 of The Reasonable Adventurer. I'm very, very excited to be having a chat with you all today. It's uh, It's been a couple a couple of days overdue this episode. In fact, if we we're honest, we'd most probably say it's a week overdue. But nevertheless, uh, that's surely given me more time to think about things, to contemplate things, and to be um, able to offer you, hopefully, an entertaining episode. Well, today's episode, found in translation, uh, isn't necessarily the opposite of episode 23, which was lost in translation, but nevertheless, it comes back to these contextual type issues. And as you know, I've been looking around for lots of um, instructions, guidance, uh, comfort uh, in relation to transformational learning. And never easy uh, to sort of step forward and to sort of try and know you're on firm footing. Um, There's a time and place for taking leaps of faith. And there are there are those other times where you really do need to be comfortable with the footing that you can get yourself onto. And yesterday, I was so happy talking with one of my old colleagues from Tasmania, and uh, she directed me to some literature on differentiated instruction. And it's always been there, but it's difficult sometimes for us to find in a higher education sector because we tend not to always look back at you know primary and high school education literature, right? Because we don't educate those people, do we? Yeah, We educate these adults, right? And it's a really weird conundrum. Because the people that we educate apparently don't fit into the adult literature, adult learning literature, but the people who write the most on education, who write about little kids, that stuff apparently doesn't always seem to apply to the people that we educate. It's a nonsense, really, isn't it? Anyway... One of the challenges that I had was how do we get people to engage in meaningful reflection uh, if they're all at different starting points, if they're all progressing at different speeds. And um, <clears throat> I was just looking for you know, uh, the basis of that process. And uh, while there's still obviously something there for me to make up for myself, it nevertheless did bring me to this literature on differentiated instruction. And uh, that gives me great confidence that I can provide different entry points for people depending on their levels of engagement, depending on their level of interest. And uh, so that's really nice because that sort of enables me to sort of be able to explain why it is that not everyone in the class will be starting at the same point despite the fact that they're using the same process, right? So that's really cool and it's a really neat thing. So uh, you might be wondering, where has the show been? Uh, We've sort of uh, missed a couple of days here. And last week, uh, and you can maybe hear from my coughing here at the moment, that I'm still not 100%, but last week I headed off to uh, to Melbourne and uh, had a conference down there. And that was good. It was very good. It's our annual conference, the Asiri Conference, uh, Entrepreneurship Folk. And... um, it was quite a productive conference, uh, very productive for me, and I'll get to that in a minute. But one of the challenges in being there was just being wrapped up in that process and then thinking, oh, that's okay, I'm going to get onto the show uh, on Friday. And then Friday became really hectic coming home, so I didn't get it done. And then I thought, it's okay, Saturday. And of course, I wake up Saturday and I'm sick. I hate being sick. Um, and unfortunately, what I got on Saturday was only a preclude of what was to come on Sunday, and then on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and I'm sort of getting back to where I want to be today, but still not quite 100%, that's for sure. So if you hear me coughing and spluttering, it's uh, simply the fact that I'm uh, forcing myself to do this show, even though I most probably feel like I need to have another day, but we don't have another day, gets things back on track. Anyway, when I was at the conference, um, one of our most respected colleagues uh, gave me some feedback on my presentation, and uh, he's been listening to 
many of my ideas in relation to firm survival for quite some time. And while those ideas don't include environmental interaction or situation awareness or energy, a lot of those big ideas that we've talked about in past episodes, they do deal with this issue of the persistence. You know, how does a firm maintain persistence through time? And anyway, I presented that, the essence of that argument. And the feedback was really cool because it was like, ah, now I actually get a real sense of what it actually is you're trying to communicate. And um, why don't you look at this article? I think you'll find that this person has done something similar and they've done a really neat job of outlining their thinking. So I downloaded that uh, paper, uh, given my impatience uh, and the and accessibility to technology. It's fantastic to be able to sit there and just download that paper and, and get stuck in. And I just thought, wow, I can see, I can see the context similarities, and I was able to find my thinking in this other person's thinking. Even though it was 26 years ago, I can see how they've tried to communicate their thinking. I can see how they've organized that thought. And I thought, wow, I can have a crack at copying this as a template and uh, trying to sort of articulate my thinking this way. So I'm very excited about that. I think that's um, really cool when you can actually find yourself through the translation of someone else's context. You know, and this is a real challenging thing we're supposed to be getting smarter as a world but i actually find it's almost the opposite yeah it's almost the opposite and and, um i find myself being in social situations at the moment (coughs) where people will um hang on a minute i'm gonna have a little drink of water here not gonna bother editing it out that's better (laughs) Um, I find myself being in social situations when people feel the need to declare um, a position which I really feel annoyed that they do. And um, and maybe this tells you something about me, right? And and so at the moment, it's almost like there's this sport on, on Donald Trump. And anything and everything that he says, does, thinks... And, and all the people connected to him. And, um, and and I think to myself, well, if half the country voted for him and the other half obviously didn't, you know, is that the same around the world? Is Does half of the world think that it's okay and the other half not think it's okay? You could think that might be quite normal. But if I was to run around and put up my flag and say, oh, yeah, I'm very happy to see Donald Trump there. Would that mean that people would assume that I am supportive of everything that he does, right? As I've explained before, I'm not a fan of Donald Trump per se. I'm not for or against him. I'm just happy that we don't have a politician running a country. I think we need to get rid of politicians. So over the lying, doing nothing class of people that find themselves in politics. I'm sure there are many people in there who are trying very hard to do something good for their constituents. But at the end of the day, the system does not work. We know that. We live it every day, yeah? So my fascination with Trump isn't about his ideology. It isn't about um, uh, what he plans to do. It's just the fact that Somebody who's not a politician is going to have a crack at doing something. People will make their minds up in a few years' time. Like him, don't like him. That's democracy. That's the way it's supposed to work. And it's almost like there's a context where everything's being rolled into one, right? And so I think to myself, okay, do you reject everything because of something? If you, if I wore a badge that says Trump, does that mean that everything about me is rejected by people who don't like Trump. And I think we're, we're, we're sliding into this very, really weird space where you can't be understood by people, right? The context of your thinking can't be translated by people, right? So we are lost in this translation. 
but no one's even bothered to attempt the translation. We're all just getting lumped into one thing or the other. So anyway, you know, that's uh, I find that interesting because it's sort of I can see the parallels between me trying to express my thoughts and the way I organize my thinking. And it's like, oh, you've used that word ecology. Ah, we don't like that. And it's like, oh, God, now I spend so much time and effort trying to explain everything else that's there. But you've rejected it because of this one word there, right? You see it happening in politics. You see it happening in other aspects of our lives as well. It's interesting. You know, it's interesting. So that uh, brought me to one of my other observations for the week, and that is this challenge of trying to understand the natural world and the world we live in, the social world. And, um, you know, a spider is trying to do pretty much what I'm trying to do. It's trying to maintain a fit with a particular environment and persist, you know, for as long as its life cycle is, you know, deemed to be. And some insects obviously have very short time spans. I saw some tortoises up at the zoo recently and they were approaching 200 years. So, you know, they're way beyond our lifespan as humans. It's the same challenge. Whether you want to live to be 200 as a tortoise or you're only going to be on the earth for a week as a fly or something else, or you're aiming to be here for 80, 90 years as a human, this challenge of being able to maintain this fit for ourselves and all the organizations that we create, it's a challenge, right? And yet we rely upon analogies and frameworks from ecology to actually help us make that sense of that process, right? But we get back to this notion of this differential instruction, right? We're not all the same, right? As much as some politicians would like us to all believe that we all have to be the same, that we all have to be equally caring, and that we all have to be as mindful of, of, of everybody's situation and all of these different things, we're not. We are different, right? And in the case of this uh, living thing like a spider and ourselves and this common desire to have this fit with a particular environment, it's a very, very different process. It's a very, very different process. So on one hand, we actually have a situation where something, a spider, inherits a set of instructions, right? And those instructions are woven and tied neatly to a particular kind of environment, yeah? The environment that the parent was already adapted to, right? And had been over many, many past generations, yeah? So from the word go, the spider already knows instinctively. It already has a sort of a guaranteed set of habits that are all engaged in spinning a web, uh, sensing what's in its web, eating prey, avoiding prey, right? And it can engage in this process, right? But it's never going to go to university and get a PhD. I've never seen a spider do that. And so there are limits to the learning that's actually related to this spider. So it has a fantastic starting point in life, right? It understands the nature of its environment. It knows how to behave in that environment, and it's able to cope, yeah? So then there's us, right? So I moved to Brisbane, right? Wow, different environment. Yeah, it's still Australia, but there's different ways of doing things, right? Might be different ways of paying bills. Might be different ways of doing your shopping. Might be different ways of getting your kids to and from school. All these different ways of doing things. So we can adjust to this because we, unlike the spider, have this greater capacity for learning. We can more fully comprehend the environment that's beyond our actual environment. So we can take an interest in American politics or what's happening in uh, Estonia or anywhere else in the world for that matter, right? We can even study these things, yeah? Uh, but we weren't born with that. We didn't inherit that capability, right? And this is the real challenge, right? We need to be able to stop and understand the context of things, right? I was watching a video before, and the journalists were getting stuck into this guy and saying, but you said this! And he turned around and said to her, and you truly 
are detaching that from the context of humor. You really can't see that that was said as a humorous comment. And now you're trying to give it back to me as a serious comment. And it just seems to be this constant process, doesn't it? Of everyone's words are coming back to haunt them. And yet the words were used in different contexts, right? And obviously there are many words and things that we don't really want to be used in any context because it sort of suggests something about us. But the reality is we all have our moments of frustration and uh, and um, different ways of thinking about things, right? I don't think anyone would have would wanted every conversation they've ever had in their entire life to have been recorded and potentially used back against them. I don't think anyone's that pure or or uh, or whatever the case may be. So what I've got out of this last week and a half beyond getting sick is this opportunity to be found in translation. If only we can stop to think about the context. We have a greater ability than the spider to change the nature of the environment around us, but we don't start from an equal point. The spider is in front of us to start with. It's already adapted to an environment as a result of what it has inherited, okay? That logical set of information, instructions on how to actually behave in a particular type of environment, yeah? Whereas we don't get that. We have to learn how to behave and how to do these things. But then we have a much bigger potential uptake in terms of where that learning may lead us. Same thing applies here. How do we take the time to understand other people's contexts and thinking so that we can actually allow this notion of a differentiated instruction set to come to us, that we actually instigate it, right? And so that we can actually find ourselves through translating other people's different contextual situations. This is not easy stuff, because I think if we all did it, then we could sort of say, oh, okay, you know, I quite like that person, but, you know, they do hold those pretty weird views about this or about that. But you know what? Overall, they're a really nice person, right? As opposed to saying, I'm going to reject you because there's something that we disagree on. That might only be one small thing. But does that mean somebody's entirely wrong? Everything about them is wrong? So there's a challenge for you. Who is it? that you've found yourself rejecting because you've labelled them a such and such, right? Could be something to do with worldviews, could be something they do locally, maybe something to do with their family structure, situation, approach. Uh, it could be any, anything, right? Um, and yet, you know, I had a very animated conversation down with in Melbourne with someone about um, climate change. And again, it always ended up in the same place. Yeah, if only we could all put this much energy into thinking about pollution, gee, the world would much be a better place. But we still keep going round round circles, right? And the passion, right? And the way people are sort of in it, and it makes you wonder, well, have we inherited something, right? Maybe not at birth, but obviously culturally along the way, which precludes us from being able to have just conversations about issues without rejecting things out of hand. No, can't talk to you because you don't this, you don't that. So that's my challenge to you. Do you think that you're capable of being found in translation? Do you think that you can unwrap the context within which people are thinking and doing things? Do you think you can separate one thing away from everything? Or does one thing constitute everything? Yeah? Yeah. It's a pretty big challenge. I can't wait to meet my new students uh, in a couple of weeks' time, and I'm certainly going to do my best to let them be 100% individual in this classroom. They still have to go through the same process of reflection, but I certainly want them to be able to find a starting point for that reflection that actually relates to where they're actually at, and so they don't have to pretend to be engaged. If they're not engaged, that's okay. But let's reflect on why that might be. And if you are super engaged, fantastic. And let's do the reflections. This excites me, and it excites me to be able to talk to the students like this, right? Because they're only cutting off their nose to spite their face if they don't want to engage in the reflection. But I don't have to force anyone to assume that they've done the work, that they've 
been fully engaged, that they're happy to be there. They can reflect on why they're unhappy to be there. I don't mind as long as they've engaged in that process of reflection because that is the pathway forward for that transformational learning process. And if we can't get them engaged and we can't give them a reflection process that they actually care about or want to engage in, then what was the point of that exercise? So hopefully something for you to think about in this episode. I look forward to talking to you next week. Cheerio. 